love that attention grabber. I could probably listen to it for hours. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you for taking your time joining this session on Windows 8, performance, troubleshooting, and deployment. I'm absolutely thrilled to be back here in Hamar. I was here last year, and I'm honored to be invited back to speak about my passion in life, technology. And I'm very proud to be part of this amazing, amazing crew of volunteers that makes this event possible year after year. Absolutely amazing. When I started my first gatherings some 20 years ago, the uh, technology was uh, quite different. We used to uh, copy floppies. No internet, no network, but one thing was the same, and that's the spirit, the passion, the learning, the contribution, having fun. That's still the same. My name is Johan, and I will be your host for the next 45 minutes. We have Windows 8 coming up, and I based the session on three pillars. One, some of the new features that you might be interested in. Then, how we can troubleshoot this, because it may come as a shock to you, a complete shock, but Windows does not always behave. It's called crash and burn. That happens. But knowing how to deal with that is the second pillar. And then the last pillar is deployment how we can deploy Windows quickly and automated. I spend my days, working days that is, traveling this blue planet of ours. I travel every week somewhere, helping organizations, enterprise companies deploy Windows. So uh, if you've seen the movie Up in the Air with George Clooney, I'm pretty much that except I, I don't fire people, and uh, I have less hair than he does. If you have any questions after the session, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, Twitter, search for me. I have a very unique last name. We're about 10 people in the world with that last name. And so far, I'm the only one doing deployment. All right. I brought a demo environment with me on stage. It's a quite powerful laptop, 32 gigs of RAM, eight CPUs, logical, and uh, 1.2 terabyte of solid state drives. That's a pretty good gaming machine for being a laptop. Now, it wasn't that expensive. Well, the SSDs were, but the memory is not anymore. You can buy an eight gig module for like $60. So that's like, uh, I don't know, 400, 300 Norwegian kroner, which is the same as about 3,000 Swedish kroner. But um, I have a bunch of VMs. I have a domain controller. I have a, a router I use for internet access. It's a Linux router. And then I have a file server, and I have a Windows 8 client. That's my environment. OK. To run Windows 8, you don't need to change anything. Because if you can run Windows 7, or God forbid, Windows Vista, on a machine, you can run Windows 8 on it as well. But the difference would be it will be more performant. It will use less memory, and you will get more frames per second when gaming. Microsoft spent quite an amount of time trying to figure out all the deadlocks that could happen in Windows 7 and try to remove them in Windows 8. It's not perfect, but it's no, pretty good enough. In Windows 8, we also have a new version of DirectX. You can have DirectX 9, but with Windows 8, you have DirectX 11.1. And Microsoft is also now backporting some of those features into Windows 7 as part of the Internet Explorer 10 upgrade so that you can do advanced graphics in, say, HTML5, et cetera, for gaming and for similar items. Now, the driver behind Windows 8 
obviously has been these types of devices. Touch-based devices. And for these devices, the new UI in Windows 8 makes absolutely sense to me. When I first saw the UI like two years ago, I was like, gee, you don't really mean to use this, do you? And, and I figured out quite quickly that I would either love the new UI or I would pretty much hate it. I ended up somewhere in between. I'm in a mode right now where I have accepted the new UI. I like to use it on a touch device, but when I use my normal desktop, a little bit more hesitant. But that's what we have. Now, if I switch over to my um, Windows 8 machine, I'm logged on as a normal user. And of course, you see this new start screen. It's not called start menu anymore. It's called a start screen. And when using touch devices, it's cool because I can just drag and drop and I can use my, my fingers. But this laptop doesn't have touch. So I'm forced to use a keyboard and mouse. So for example, control minus will zoom out and give me an overview of all my pinned shortcuts. And of course, I can drag around these groups the way I want them. I can start to name them if I like. And can call this one TG13, for example, and we'll give the name. I can zoom in again. I can rearrange these tiles. But the starting screen that you see here is it's only what you have pinned. But if you do win Q, you will see all the applications that you have in your system or it's available on the sort of used to be start menu. But if I want to find something, I simply just type notepad or whatever I'm trying to find, and Windows will locate it for me. I can do Windows and W, and I will get the settings. That's the sort of shortcuts to the control panel applets. I can do Win X, and I will get a power menu in the left-hand corner for, for techies that you, know, you can start the event viewer, you can start device manager, you can start a command prompt as an admin, et cetera. Of course, if you want to start something, like the command prompt here, if I go back, I can use control shift enter and then it will open up elevated as an administrator. You can see it says admin here. And let me just kick off zoom it. So I will be able to do, do stuff like this. But a normal command prompt of course if I start it, it will run as a normal user. I'm logged on as an admin. I'm, I'm in the admin group. But when I start stuff, if I don't tell Windows I want to run them elevated, it will run as a normal user account. When you do a copy and paste, for example, you have, um, I have an ISO file in this folder. It's a SQL Server 2012, and I copy it down to another disk. You will have a richer UI where you see the copying taking place. You get some history, and the, the, the counters are actually more accurate than they used to be. Again, they're not perfect, but they're more accurate than they used to be in, in, in Windows 7. You also get the history about the speed you used to get and time remaining and such. Then the cool thing in Windows 8 and of course Server 2012 is, is PowerShell. Most stuff that you can do in Windows, you can do through PowerShell. This is like an Uber version of the command prompt. It's like, uh, it's like Bash, but Windows. Objects you have access to, you can do anything. If I would like to create a new virtual machine for my virtual machine environment, I can do that. If I don't remember the different uh, options, I can simply tab and it will continue and complete that information for me. If I want to learn about the command, I can run show command and I can type the same command again. Uh, new VM that was. And now I'll get a UI for the command prompt so I can start to fill in information. I would like to create a virtual machine named TG13 01, and it should have this amount of memory. And then I can either run that or I can copy it and I can open Notepad and paste it in. And I can adjust the font a bit here. So I have a UI that helps me that build stuff that I can then run in the PowerShell prompt. Of course, I also have a richer editor for running script in Windows these days, and that's ICE. If you don't have this on a Windows 8 box, it's because you did not enable admin tools. 
On the Windows 8 machine, we have something called Charms, which is on the right hand screen. And if you go to settings on the Windows 8 box, this is where you can enable the admin tools, which will pin another uh, series of shortcuts on the start screen. And one of those shortcuts uh, will be ICE. If we have a No worries. I will uh, steal 14 more seconds of my time back later. Now, in the eyes editor, I can do the same command. I can zoom in a little bit here as well. But as I type a new command, I get immediate a drop down of all the available options I have for that command. Same story as before. And I can have several commands in a script. I can select to run them all. I can select to run them line by line. Or if I want to learn more about the command, I can type it here. And I can see more information about that command. And I can get details, which will give me back the window I had before. Now, in Windows 8, if I go to the VM again, if I go to services, you will find that a lot more services compared with Windows 7 are actually not running at all time. There will be a trigger start on many of the services. So why does Microsoft do this? Well, think laptop, think slate device, think iPad but Windows, and think battery. They want to have more battery life out of your machines, so they disable a lot more services in Windows, and they are based on triggers to start. For example, if I go to a machine, the group policy client is actually not started here. But you can see the startup type for this service is automatic. But again, it's based on triggers. So group, group policies in Windows is a way to control settings that you have. And you can do that locally by opening the local policy editor. And you can edit some 3,000 various policies in the system. For example, you can control what hardware you are allowed to install, what devices you can install, etc. But you can do this from the server side as well. So if I go to a domain controller and open up the Group Policy Management Console, I can create policies that will affect many machines at the same time. So for example, I can create a new policy here, TG13-2, 3. And I can edit that policy. And for example, I can go in and uh, control, uh, I can create shortcuts on a user's um, desktop or any folder. I can control Internet Explorer. And you can do uh, IE5, 7, 8, 10, whatever version you'd like. Or I can do regional settings. So I can go in and I can say, all right, for all the machines that's going to be hit by this policy, I will run uh, Romania, user locale. And the time will be uh, uh, minutes and uh, hours here. Not very useful, maybe, but uh, it's a setting I can have. And all these policies, all these preferences I can control, I can actually target. So I can do item level targeting and say, all right, I will take this policy and I will apply it to 45 computers, but only if date match equals something. For example, April 1st. So I can do a policy that will completely change the keyboard, the regional settings, the language on a single given day for a bunch of computers at the same time. Can you imagine how fun you can have with this in, in a large company? But anyway, all these policies requires that the group policy service is running on the client. But if I go back to the client again, it wasn't. 
was, but it will still pick up the policies. Why? Because of scheduled tasks. In Windows 8, if you go to the task scheduler, if I can type, you will see some 176 tasks being available in the system, doing something, but they are actually based on triggers. So they will only happen once in a while when the system actually needs it. So if I go to the group policy here, I would see nothing. Right? Makes sense. P policy is not running, but it's nothing here. Now, of course, I'm not running as an admin, so I need to elevate myself. So I will open up a command prompt again, control shift enter to get it elevated, and I will start the same tool once more. I will close it down. So I will start the management console as an admin. I will go to my schedule library. I will find my group policy service. Still nothing. I'm an admin at this point. I'm running this as an admin. I still don't see it. Turns out that many of these services, many of these triggers are actually elevated by the system itself. So I need to start the tool as a system. And that's where a friend from System Tunnels comes in play. Uh, they used to be a separate company, but Microsoft bought them several years ago. And for example, you can use PSExec, uh, if I can type it correctly, dash S for system, dash F, I for interactive, and then I can open up a command prompt as system, a yellow command prompt as system. And now I can start the same command again, try to type it correctly again. So now I'm opening the scheduler as system. And then if I go to group policy, all right, this is where I will find the triggers. That every once in a while, every 90 minutes or so, will trigger and start the group policy service so that the client will get the policies from the server. And this goes for a bunch of bunch of services in Windows. And again, this is to make sure that Windows does not drain your battery unless you actually have to. Now, how many of you are actually using Windows to game on? And when you do gaming, you are really much into this type of performance. You want to cram out every possible inch that you can have out of the performance counters. But first of all, what you can do in Windows, in Windows 8, you can take your setup, you can take your image, and you can transfer it to a USB stick. And this is nice. Kingston, Super Talent, Imation, Western Digital, and Spry, they all have USB sticks that can run Windows. It's not really USB sticks. It's actually a really, really small solid state drive that is bootable. So you can have your Windows PC on a stick with all your games installed. And when you go home to a friend to play, you can just put it in that computer and it will boot from that USB stick. Automatically find and install the driver it needs. Or um, why not use it as a sort of a backup when you need to do work at home? You can bring your corporate PC bit it back home. They are a bit expensive still, but you can get a USB stick that can run Windows 8 for maybe $70, $75 in that price range. Now, performance, of course, is about responsiveness. It's about getting a system when you click something, it actually happens. Otherwise, you will get this look on your face. Now, believe it or not, but the performance enhancement in Windows 8 actually started back with Windows Vista. Windows Vista wasn't that great. But that was the foundation that Windows 7 and Windows 8 started to build on. Because with Windows Vista, Microsoft starting to fine tune stuff. They start to give you tools to troubleshoot performance, which was not available before. 
And that continued in Windows 7 and Windows 8. For example, Superfetch is a mechanism in Windows to preload stuff that you normally run into RAM or align them on the disk so you can start more quickly. Ready Boost is the feature that if I find you use it, I will smack you on the side of the head. Because Ready Boost is using an external USB drive as memory. So you have like a gig memory in the machine and you try to use a drive as memory. That's a bad idea altogether. If you can't get like two, three, four gigs of RAM to run Windows on, don't run Windows. Ready Boost is not the solution for not buying enough RAM to run Windows. Then the industry itself start to learn how to write device drivers that were performant. And what you will see in Windows 7 and Windows 8 is they not load one by one anymore. They are loading in parallel. So that's why we can see on some devices, some new slate devices, some new ultrabooks, they will boot, cold boot, seven or eight seconds, which is pretty good. They will hibernate in a second. And that's because this driver starting in parallel compared with uh, previously. I talked about the services, of course. But the thing is that Windows 8 for you is at least the same hardware that you were used to run Windows 7 on. It, Windows 8 will run the same apps, but it will run them more performant than on Windows 7. Now, if you have a slow system and you work at the company as a consultant or a, an IT manager or a sysadmin, the users will tell you. Or you get that Friday call from a friend who just needs a little bit of advice, or even worse, it could be family. And then you have to help. So uh, it can either be two ways of this. Either they will ask you nicely for assistance to help them troubleshoot why the machine doesn't boot very quickly, or it's more like this. If it's a user in a company and they need your help, they rather scream and, all right, we need to do something. Inside Windows, we have a bunch of new tools, or I should say change tools, that can help you to do troubleshooting of performance. So if I go to my client, the good old task manager has been around for quite some time, but you can see it's different. You can open up in a minimal mode, or you can open it up in a sort of an advanced mode or a more detailed mode. This is where you can see the performance of each uh, shorthand summary, CPU memory, etc. You will see all your processes. You will see the app history of things. But if I go back to processes, for example, if I find my sumit command, I can go and say, analyze weight change. It was added in Windows 7. It's now available as well in Windows 8. And now I can see all the processes that Sumit actually is depending on to do stuff. You also have the uh, good old uh, Perfmon, which is the trusted performance monitor. You can open resource monitor, or you can do start run Resmon, which will give you an overview of CPU, memory, disk, etc and where you will be able to see exactly what processes are doing what in the system. There is another component, it's called reliability history. Reliability history. Which will give you a state of your machine since the day you installed it until now. And you can see for each day what was going on. Apparently on the March 8 here, I did install a bunch of components. Let me open up a screenshot from a live system. This is more like a live system. If you work with support, and let me just start zoom it here. You can actually get an overview of the entire machine from the day it was deployed until now. And when the user calls and asks for help, and you ask them, what did you do? Nothing. You can just go in here and see, well, 
those 200 applications you deployed from that PC magazine of yours, they might have to do something with it. Do you think? Yeah, I think. But it will give you information about what was going on in the system day by day by day. Quite powerful. Now, of course, the best thing you can do for performance is to buy solid state drives. It's the single most performance enhancing feature you can get. It's the finest present you can give yourself for Christmas. Because you can take a four year old laptop, you put in a solid state drive in it, and it will spin in circles around a brand new laptop that does not have a solid state drive. In Windows 8, when you add a Windows solid state drive, you don't have to do anything. Windows 8 will learn that it's solid state drive and it will actually configure the system accordingly. So for example, do not disable defrag, which you normally would do for a solid state drive, but don't do that in Windows 8. The reason is Windows 8 detects it and instead of doing a defrag, it actually do a trim command instead for the defrag, which you have to do on a solid state drive. Then we have tools from our friends, system tunnels, that can help us troubleshoot stuff that's going on in Windows. So for example, if I open up um, my Windows 8 machine again, go to my setup folder, system tunnels, tools, whoop, suite, procmon. I have Procmon and I have Process Explorer. Process Explorer will give me details about the processes in my system. It's like an Eber version of the task manager. So I can find the same processes here, I can do properties, and I will get more information about them. And for example, I can see each individual process, the performance it's using, or I can find more information from the binaries of that file. Say that you are looking for uh, hidden command line switches in utilities, you can actually search for them here. And you can find undocumented switches that you can use for you know, various commands. So strings is part of the pro uh, process explorer as well. Or you can do process monitor, which is a tool to uh, view what an application does in my system. So I can set a filter to watch, for example, Notepad XE. And when I started the monitoring, it will now log everything that Notepad does on my hard drive and in the registry of my machine. So if I start up Notepad and change something like the, I will change the font from console into uh, Times, Times New Roman, and then I will exit Notepad. Now I have, and I will stop the monitoring. Now you can see that Procmon recorded some 5,000 events in Windows which was needed for a notepad to change the font to times. But now I can actually start to see what Windows did for the notepad process. So I can search for times. And I can see that Windows actually tried to create uh, the file times. It tries to create the font itself. But it's not really create, it's more like if, 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 it, a little bit, if it exists, opens it. So it's not a create. And, and then you can see Windows will, will do that one more time just, just to make sure. And a few one more time. So I will continue to search for times. And you can see Windows tried to do it again. It, it's really thorough when it tries to do things here. So more times, times italic, times bold italic, uh, times bold again, uh, and times again. Then it starts to read the file. Oh, great, finally. Uh, more reading. No, this one is interesting. This way you can see that Notepad actually wrote something in my registry. So if you're trying to figure out where in the system an application has settings, you can use this utility. And you can actually just right click here and say jump to, which will hypnotize the registry and take me to that location. 
And then I can see where Notepad is, is storing the settings. Then there is a download. It's called the ADK. It's a nifty 2.5 gig download from Microsoft. But in that download, you have new performance tools. You have UI-based performance tools. It's the analyzer and the recorder. But the cool thing is in the command line tools. For example, imagine that friend that called you on the Friday night to uh, help you troubleshoot why a machine didn't boot. Well, it actually took four minutes to boot. Or why it took two minutes to log in. How could you troubleshoot that? Well, with these tools, you can. So there is an XPerf tool, which is stopping and starting traces in Windows. There is a viewer. And there is an XBoot manager that will monitor the entire reboot of a machine. So let me show you how these tools work. So I will go to my Windows 8 client. I will open up a command prompt. I will run XPerf dash profiles. Profiles means ready-made tests or monitors that I can use in my system to troubleshoot performance. And it will give me a list back. The most commonly used ones are the ones that are called general in buffer, meaning start a trace, monitor the common stuff, and store it in memory. Unless you're doing long-term analysis, this is the recommended option. But you can also store the result in a file directly. But um, I will copy this one. I hate typing. So I will run XPerf. I will run start. And I will paste it in. How many think it will uh, work? It won't. A parameter is incorrect. I copied and pasted. This is the error message you get when you don't run the command prompt as an admin. I'm a user. So I will open up an elevated command prompt, Control Shift Enter. I will take the same command that failed, and I will run it here. And now monitoring is started. So now I can do some uh, magic here. I can open up. Uh, Microsoft Paint, and I can uh, try to draw something. Mm, very nice. I'm a master at Microsoft Paint, as you can see. Um, I can open up Internet Explorer or whatever browser you prefer, do something. And when I'm done doing my stuff, I will stop the trace, stop, and I will store it somewhere. So, demo. TG13-49.etl. So now the trace is being stopped, and it will store this in memory. It will take a little while for it to generate the trace. But once it's done, I can use XPerf once more, and I can simply open it. TG14-49etl. And then it will open up in the XPerf view, which will give me system metrics about what was going on in my system at this time. And I will see the normal metrics for CPU, for example. I will have the idle states. I will have the disk. I will have the disk I.O. during that period. And if I want to, I can actually zoom in and zoom out in this information. I can also overlay. I can overlay CPU with, for example, disk I.O. So I can see how the, well the CPU is matching what's being read and written on the disk. I can drill down here and eventually, whoops, a bit too fast. I can see all the processes that was going on during that time frame. So here I can see uh, I was actually using paint here for a while. And I was using Internet Explorer a bit later on, etc. And what I also can do is I can go to the disk, for example, 
Where did we go, my friend? There we go. Right click and do a detailed graph of the disk. And I will see all the sectors on my hard drive and what processes that was actually writing and re bleh, reading and writing on what sector on the disk. And this can be used to try to find when you don't have solid state drives, we have applications that are slow because they are reading from many different sectors on that hard drive. All right. What if, if I want to uh, monitor an entire boot of a machine? I can actually use XBoot Manager and I can do a trace boot. I will just go to a folder where I can store this. Demo, I will create a folder TG13 49. Uh, whoa. That's not my intention. I will run the XBoot Manager, trace, boot, and please know that if, if you run this command, it, it will reboot the machine. But it will start monitoring from now on until it comes back again. So you will see an overview of the entire boot process. So it's starting to trace, and then it, it will reboot the machine, and my remote server, of course, will, well, disconnect. But if I go back to Hyper-V Manager, which of course I can run in Windows 8 as well, uh, I have, I don't know, maybe 70 virtual machines here, but I will go to my PC number two, and you can see it's rebooting, and eventually it will come back up, and I will be able to log in again, but I will log in through remote desktop. It will now log in, and in about 20 some seconds, it will stop the monitoring, and uh, rather it will continue two more minutes, and then it will stop. So I should see that shortly. There will be a sort of a dialogue coming up, because sometimes there are processes going on. What you have logged in, but Windows is still doing stuff, right? You've seen that, but I will finish the trace, and it will store it locally. And then it will tell me where I can find it. All right, thank you. Ah, come on. So now I can open up that again. Xperf. Demo. Tiki39. Boot, trace. And I will have a trace from the entire reboot of that machine. Everything that was going on, any processes that was taking place during that reboot, what drivers it tried to load, et cetera, and how long time it took for them to load each and every driver on that system. So if I open up a live trace that I have on this machine, whoa, that was white. Uh, let me see if I store it on this one, maybe. Uh, no, that's not the one. This is a trace from a live system, not a virtual machine. As you can see, it takes much longer time to load. This is a machine that took almost two minutes to boot. And we were trying to figure out why it took so long for it to boot. So I'm opening that trace, which I captured with the export manager command. And as you can see here, when we start to uh, look into what was going on, we can see that, all right, apparently the Google crash handler was doing something in the beginning here, and in the end, there was a Flash Player update service kicking in. If I rely on all the checkpoints and lifetimes here, 
we can actually see that everything that was going on during this boot, so of course it was stopping and starting here, you know, really critical services that you need to have on a Windows box. And in the end, you see that old junk that, that comes from an OEM machine starting this, you know, optimization and utilities and stuff that you normally don't want, but this is how you can see what's going on during that reboot and how long time it takes for each component. So for example, if the Steam client would take like two minutes to, to start and stop, well, I can try to see if there is a new version of the Steam client and whatever. But the story is without these tools, it's impossible to see what's going on in the system during that reboot. Okay. And the final piece. There is a tool that you can download. It's called Deployment Toolkit. It's um, free software. It can be used by enterprise companies to deploy 50,000 computers automated, or it can be used by you to deploy three, and any combination in between. And so just to give you a quick overview of that tool, as I said, it's a free download. What you get is a workbench. That's the main UI. But in here, you simply add your applications, you add your operating system images, you add in your drivers, and then you create sequences. Sequence is just a list of stuff to do when you start a deployment. For example, installing the image, injecting drivers, installing applications. So if I start a deployment, I go to an empty machine here. And boot on a media. It will start on that media, connect to the service share, give me a list of sequences, and I can then start a deployment. And the cool thing about this solution is that, again, it's free, but you can also make an offline version of it. So once you have the normal deployment going, you can say, here's my USB stick. Please take what you have here and put them on my USB stick. So now you can go to any device, just put that USB stick in, and you will be prompted with the same information as you see here. I'm logging in. I will select the sequence. Windows 8. Give it the name. Select a few applications. Done. In six minutes, I will have a Windows deployed in this VM, or if you're using USB stick on a physical hardware. All right. It means I'm up. Thank you guys for attending and have a great, great gathering. Thank you.